Okay, thank you all for uh, coming out here today on such a cold morning. I know I was tempted to just stay at home, but I figured I probably shouldn't. Um, I was also told that uh, um, if, if you, uh, to tell you the Wi-Fi information, in case people want to connect, uh, the, the network here is NPC Wi-Fi, and the password is wireless for number four free NPC, if you're interested. Okay, so we're here today we're to talk about um, video market. Uh, so we know this is a $160 billion a year market. It's the most popular uh, leisure activity for Americans. Uh, I'm sure our, our founders are, are proud of us for that. Uh, and, but we're starting to see pretty radical changes in this, in this market. Uh, for the first time, pay, uh, traditional pay TV is starting to lose subscribers. Uh, we see Netflix surging. It announced uh, you know, a slightly better than expected results for its uh, most recent quarter and strong guidance, and it went up 20% yesterday or the day before yesterday. Uh, its stock went up that much. Verizon is just buying Intel's video uh, service, and everybody seems to want to be in this, in this game. At the same time, we have the net neutrality decision, which may or may not affect this market. Um, we have uh, proposals for a la carte. Um, there's always the uh, retransmission issues. So those are just some of the things we'll talk about today. Uh, and we have a good, really good panel. Um, I'm going to go, uh, I'll go down this way. It's in reverse alphabetical order just because I'm at the end of the alphabet, so I always like to do that. Um, so our first uh, speaker is uh, uh, Jeff Prince, uh, who's an associate professor and the Kathy and Jerry Anderson faculty fellow at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Uh, he has uh, done research on things like household level risk aversion, airline quality competition, uh, healthcare regulation, but also focuses, um, uh, his, his primary focus is on uh, technology markets and telecom. And he has a new paper uh, primarily on cord cutting and uh, other issues on um, uh, consumers and, and video with, uh, with Shane Greenstein. And we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, then, uh, actually, I guess we're not going to reverse alphabet, where are we? Um, sort of. <laughs> but anyway, then we have Howard, um, Howard Hobanoff, uh, who is a media executive, management consultant, a lawyer, and an academic. And he, he has um, expertise at evaluating and executing digital uh, media growth strategies. Um, he's also served as, uh, um, as an associate professor and program director for the master's degree program in television management at Drexel University. And he has written, he writes uh, about almost everything that happens in, in the space. Uh, and Paul Gallant is um, a managing director at Guggenheim Securities. Uh, he advises internet, uh, institutional investors on um, technology and media, telecom, and political and regulatory policy. And uh, before he was in the financial world, he was in the, um, the policy world and the business world. He was spent some time at the FCC uh, and, at, uh, uh, and at Quest as well. So we'll start with, uh, with, with Jeff. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, about your paper, um, sort of what, your, what your main findings are, uh, how you reach them, and, uh, and, and what, what surprised you. Sure. Uh, first, thanks for putting this together, Scott. This is a, it's a great venue. Um, so. I'm, as many in this room are, I believe, I was very interested in cord cutting and some of the determinants of uh, what caused people to cord cut. And so, uh, you know, one of my drum beats today will be, you know, thinking about how do we get more data involved in this process for research. Uh, so as I'll kind of mention some of my results with this study, um, you'll see that the data have shortcomings, but we basically tried to get as much as we could out of what we had. And so the idea here is, you know, what, when you think about you know, this, this recent trend of people dropping you know, traditional TV service, cable, satellite, uh, that type of thing, um, trying to think about what are some of the drivers behind that. So we were thinking about things like uh, our data spanned the, the late first decade of the 2000s, so 809 is uh, primarily what we're looking at. So there's going to be some timing issues as far as you know, what carries over until today. But um, what we're thinking about is things like you know, over the top started to become on the horizon, on the scene around that time. Um, and then you also had the digital switchover right around that time with over the air. And then you also had a recession. So there was a lot going on at that time period to, to generate a lot of action um, as to what was going on. And so we wanted to get a sense of, um, can we get an idea of what consumers' preferences look like? What are some things that, that drive the cord cutting decision? And the way the data are constructed, the best, best opportunity we, we had was to think about things like uh, content preferences. And so what's nice about the data we have, and 
to give you a quick summary of it, it, it comes from Forrester Research. It's survey data where people would describe, you know, what are they subscribing to, what kind of content do they watch, things like that. Um, and so what we essentially, the, the insight of the paper is to say, well, if you've got a change in the marketplace, and in particular what was changing was with over the top, you had some content now available that you could just get over the internet. So if you had broadband content, uh, connection, you could now get some television content just straight through the internet without subscribing uh, to traditional television. And then you also had the digital switchover, which depending on who you ask, you could say it was a quality upgrade. Uh, some, in some places you could make the case that it wasn't. But the point being that depending on what your preferences were, what kind of content you prefer to watch, you would have differential responses to that change. So the idea being that if, if over the top provides certain content, I, the channel I always have in mind is Comedy Central. So Comedy Central has a lot of stuff that you can get over the top. And uh, if I'm a Comedy Central watcher, you would think that I would be more prone to respond to a change in its availability over the top than if I'm somebody that watches content that wasn't made available newly over the top. And so that's kind of the insight that drives the paper where we look at are there differential responses to this change in the marketplace across people with different stated preferences over content? And I think what's really interesting and what we find is at least in that early time period, nothing really shows up there. So it, what, what really what this seems to say is that uh, it's not the relative content availability, at least at the early stages between over the top or even over the air. Uh, versus what you get on traditional television that's driving that decision as to whether to cut the cord or not. Um, and I guess, you know, that might seem counterintuitive, but I think, I think what I have in mind as to what that's saying is that the decision to switch, people aren't saying, oh, let me check out everything that's available over the top, let me check out all the features that now the digital switchover provides, and then make a decision as to whether to drop. It's more that other things, other shocks to the system are causing that drop. At least in this case, you had income shocks that were going on. Uh, you have people that might prefer the, the delivery method of over the top versus traditional uh, television, or at least be more interested in that. Um, so lots of things, uh, actually being someone that had done the exact same thing, I'm an example of where there was a shock where I had direct TV, and, uh, I had trouble with the signal and it was up on our roof and I just didn't want to go up on the roof anymore. And so I just said, all right, I'm going to cut the cord for a while. And uh, so I would be an example where that I had a shock that had nothing to do with my content preferences. Um, so we found that pretty intriguing, especially given that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that might be driving this decision. Content seems the obvious thing, um, but at least in the early stages, that didn't seem to be the driving force, what the relative content offerings were. Well, some of the, I mean, some of the, the implications of that are, are kind of interesting. It, one thing it suggests is that uh, all of the, the spending on original programming, for example, by Netflix and Amazon and so on, uh, isn't likely to be a driver, uh, to, isn't likely to cause many people to switch, although certainly the actors in the market must believe it because they're investing a lot of money in it. Um, but it also suggests that uh, efforts by the traditional MSOs to um, say upgrade their uh, their their user interfaces um, with with using TiVo for example instead of their own uh, would be effective in keeping subscribers. I mean, do you think is that is that something that would flow from the results of your paper? So uh, at least with the former point, I uh, although I think it's it's somewhat seems intuitive that the idea then would be the new content's not going to be effective what they're what they're engaged in now like Netflix with House of Cards and these other programs that now are original. Um, even in the paper, we make the point that, in a sense, I actually think that it shows the, the foresight of that approach. Because what we're finding is when you essentially just uh, replicate what the traditional television providers are, are doing with over the top, there's not much of a response to that. But in a sense, with the new content, what they're doing is, is changing the message, right? That here's something that you can only get with us and you can't get with the other guys. And so it, it calls more attention to the content differential between the two rather than just trying to, to match. You're, you're saying here's something different. And so it's, it's bringing a new attention, a new perspective to the, the cord cutting opportunity. And on top of that, um, what I suspect might be happening with some people is they do both, right? So they multi-home. So they'll say, I'll, I've got my traditional television. Oh, Netflix has this. Meaning. meaning doing both a subscription to television and a subscription to mm -hmm. say over the top like Netflix. And so uh, I'll go ahead and get that new content that Netflix is offering. 
And then having done that, say, well, maybe I can get by with just Netflix and then cord cut from there. So in a sense, it's, it's potentially a different path to get people to take this different approach. Is it something that it might affect um, stickiness of, of viewers rather than um, switching per se? Uh, you mean as far as the new content's mm -hmm. concerned? That's hard to say. I, our, our research doesn't get after that. I, I, we've done some stuff on, uh, on the bundling that goes on at the, the technology level, so the triple play bundling, and, and shown that uh, that does create some stickiness. So if I have a bundle, when we uh, actually finished that paper shortly after Vonage came out with that commercial where they've got the, the man holding the babel, baby and his wife says, oh, we got to get rid of this bundle before you know it's too late and we'll never be able to get rid of it. And he's thinking she's talking about the baby and panicking. And, uh, and in a sense, it was very consistent with what our findings said, which was that uh, you know, if, I, if I have a bundle for the, the across the technologies, phone, TV, internet, that uh, I'm less prone to drop those services than if you take the same person and they, they don't have them in a bundled status. Um, and let me, I, you know, it's always, it's always dangerous to predict out of sample. Uh, and I know especially academics don't, don't like to um, make predictions outside of the research, but I'd like you to do just that. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what do you think, how do recent trends, I mean, since, since your data, uh, how do trends in, in subscribership of these various sources um, match with, with what you found? Is it, does it seem to be, what, does it seem that, that we're on now a different path, or does it seem to confirm, uh, or is it consistent with what you found? I'd say it's, well, so it's, it's largely consistent. I think for us, we were, we were very reluctant to say, you know, what we found, how much that indicates what the trend will be moving forward. So if you think about from 2009, what, what make our data both good and bad is, is the economic shock at that point in time. So you had this income shock that, in a sense, forced a lot of people to reconsider some of the things that they buy and they pay significant money for. And in a context like that, you then can really see some revealed preferences. And so that, that was helpful. But on the flip side, you know, that shock's not going to last forever, and it hasn't. And so the question then was, you know, is this, is this a trend or is this kind of a one-time deal? Um, at the very least, it seems that some of the things that were going on, some of the, the dropping that was going on uh, wasn't just unique to that time period. So it's not that, um, in a sense of what's the universal value of having done research in 0809 for today's marketplace. I think, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's useful because some of the, the actions that were going on then are still occurring now, even without this kind of big shock. Uh, to the system, but now you've got these these new pieces to the puzzle, like uh, original content from over the top. You've now got Aereo coming on board, um, so there's there's new pieces to the puzzle that I think might change, you know, what what the overall dynamic is. But I think some of the the subtleties that we found in 0809, um, as far as the cord cutting demographics who cord cut, um, and even. I, there's no reason for me to believe that the, the point we made with regard to the, the duplication of content doesn't still hold today. So it's, uh, the question then becomes, how much does the new content change how people uh, make those decisions? Right. Um, that's a good segue, I think, to Howard. Um, Howard, I, what, when, when you look at um, what's been happening most recently, the last few quarters or the last year or so, uh, how, does it, um, how does it fit with what with what Jeff was saying, I mean, is is original is it is it important for um, is it, how, how important is it for sort of changing the nature of the marketplace and shifting this 160 billion dollars around from the different players in the market? Well, look, I, I think that everybody is in in the um, ecosystem is grappling with what is the what are the most appropriate business models working forward for the creation. Uh, and distribution, exploitation, and consumption of media content. Uh, and there is no question that the appeal of, you know, that, that over-the-top services like Netflix, and I heard an interesting quote from uh, Ted Sarandis, who oversees their programming acquisition uh, not that long ago, said, you know, for Netflix, we don't have everything there is to watch. But there's always something to watch, and I think that that you know that 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 in, in that world that uh, having an alternative to the traditional multi-channel video bundle, where there is always something. I mean, for those you, you know, my kids don't like that. It, not every single movie that they've ever heard of or seen is on Netflix, which they find frustrating, and yet 
there is always something. And so even if they have to go back and watch an old episode of Blossom, uh, that, you know, that there is something that, that, that they find of interest to watch. But I, I think that, um, that what I uh, am often asked about and, and people are really trying to grapple with is what, again, what's the business model going forward? For a long time, the business um, had it, um, you know, had this kind of template that all you had to do was execute well um, and we know what it is, which is if we get if we can get our cable network launched, if we can get it on, and I'll start with cable. I won't go back to the start of broadcast. Um, I may look old, but I'm not quite that old. Um, but the but the the um, you know from the from the earliest days of success of of cable you know linear cable networks, it's we get the ca the cable network up, we get at least 30 million plus subscribers. We can sort of see what and if we get a rating of X. We sort of plot it out and we kind of know where the CPM is going to be. Uh, we, we can project out with some degree of certainty what kind of sub fees we can expect. And there you ha and then eventually we'll sell it to a bigger media company for billions of dollars and, and there you go. Well, it's, it, it's, not, it's just not that, not that that was ever easy for those of you who, who ever had to try to sell anything to TCI and John Malone, but, um, but it, you knew what the template was, and th and that really doesn't exist anymore. There are a lot of templates, and you know the fact of the matter is that as you as you are uh, developing content and looking to have a successful business, the end of the day you've got to get the money out of the consumer, and that th that's it. There's only one pocket. It's the consumer's pocket. Now, how which which of the consumers? multiple pockets you go after and what the right balance is, that's, the, that's the, the magic, the art, and the science of it. But, you know, either the consumer will pay, be willing to pay something directly, they'll be willing to pay their cable bill, they'll be willing to buy um, a DVD, and less and less of that, of course. Uh, they'll be willing to lease it, to watch it, um, to, to download it and watch it over a period, you know, for a certain period of time and then give it back. Um, or there's that the consumer is going to pay in directly through the advertisers. Advertisers don't advertise because they enjoy supporting excellent television. They do it because it sells product. And so P&G only ad pays to advertise uh, in media so that people will buy more Tide and that they will be a more successful business in what it is that they create. So, but for them, it, it only works if in advertising on or through media, uh, they are then realizing their benefits. So the, that I think the, um, I don't know if I'm at all addressing your question, Scott, but, the, but, my, but my overarching point uh, is that, um, that, that there is no, oh, the answer is X. Um, and I don't think that, that uh, you know, Jeff's research or anybody's research yet, um, because it would be really valuable if he could just say the answer is X and we'd all go out and, and then try to execute on that business model. But it's trying to find, um, at the end of the day, you only make, people only make content, and I'll put aside vanity projects and, you know, the, 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 um, uh, my kids, uh, my kids uh, online videos that they've created, et cetera, um, in, in order to, to have it be a successful business and career and, and, and get a sufficient return on that and figuring out how to make that happen and the great challenges and how do you do that to support the kind of the quality and the level and of, of excellent programming that people um, uh, hope for, expect, uh, and sometimes even get. So actually that brings up a, another thing. I, um, in, in order for advertisers uh, and, and video distributors to know what is successful, you have to have some data on it. Um, and Jeff hinted at this too. And I know you've, I mean, I saw you, you, you posted something about this recently. Um, we've relied on Nielsen data for a long time. Uh, and that in sort of the, the era of big data, it seems sort of a strange approach, these sur surveys where people selected to, I mean, what, what other approaches are there for figuring out um, what content succeeds and what doesn't? And why? Does Nielsen remain sort of the currency of of of, of, of video? Um... Well, um, you know, it rem it's it's it remains the currency because it's the currency, hmm. you know, and and so there is an enormous amount of simply inertia that continues to dominate much of the daily commerce of the media business, and 
from a logical perspective now, the notion that uh, 14,000 homes that have signed up for a Nielsen box um, to have in their home, uh, that really still dominates the purchase and sale of 60, 70 billion dollars of media at a time when you have, um, uh, you know, the you know digital homes, which are in the uh, the the you know 75 percent of the multi-channel homes are digital boxes, and you can get the set-top box information, which is second by second data on exactly what people are watching for how long and when they've turned off the commercial, etc. But the practicalities in the market of getting uh, getting uh, a, an alternative or better, the data is out there, the data is available. It's the people aren't, I don't find that clients are hungering for data, they're hungering for information. And, and information is the taking, distilling the data into a useful, digestible form that, and in a language that everybody will speak commonly. And everybody still speaks. <coughs> the common language of what, what was your Nielsen, what's the Nielsen number, and, and okay, I know how to go sell that. Um, and in terms of the digital platform, uh, that is still very much evolving, and it's not that the technology isn't there to, to find the data and to use it, but, but the business of, of, of uh, mining that information appropriately is still lagged, I think. By the way, you should, you should keep, hold on to that phrase for a panel on big data when you're on one to set. Remind <laughs> people there's a difference between data and information. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's good for lots of panels. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, so actually, so let's turn to some, uh, some policy issues. Uh, and and um, Paul, I know you follow these closely and, and how they affect, uh, and, and how, how they affect investors. So, the biggest one right now um, is the net neutrality decision, uh, or at least the, the biggest the biggest change. How do you think that's going to affect the the market and the different players in it? Yeah, it was a pretty big de a pretty big deal. Um, the this is something that the the cable and phone companies have been working toward on um, you know a legal, a political, a policy basis for a long time, and I think they're there now, and. Um, what they basically want, as, as people in this room probably know, is the opportunity, I think, to evolve their broadband business and have the chance to create a second revenue stream from broadband. And they have finally gotten there, I think, with the court decision that gives the FCC authority to have net neutrality rules, but to have rules that are not so strict that carriers can't go out and at least explore these new business models. So I think from the carry, and you have a chairman of the FCC that is signaling that he is open to at least exploring that sort of new way of thinking about broadband. So I think it's it's a good position for the carriers to be in. Um, I don't think that they're going to do anything anytime soon to blow it politically, uh, because everybody is sort of on alert right now, watching to see how carriers react to this. Um, I mean, you heard Netflix's uh, Netflix uh, said to their investors recently within the past few days that this is something to keep an eye on. You know, there are worst case scenarios for us where cable, you know, or ISPs, broadband providers, do things that try to extract new money from us in ways we don't want to pay. Uh, so clearly it's an issue for Netflix and Amazon and Google and anybody who has a sort of high bandwidth stuff that they sell to consumers. But, um, but the, the cable and phone companies are in, are in a much better position today than they were about two weeks ago. Um, so. I don't think anything is going to change overnight in the way that they do business. Um, and it may turn out that the companies that you would think that the broadband providers are looking at now, potentially wanting to engage in some discussion about payment, either, you know, sort of quality of service type deals, they may not want to pay. Netflix, Amazon, Google are, are the big targets, I assume. And if they don't want to pay, then the question is, is there anything that the broadband providers can do to um, sort of rearrange the way that they, they uh, exchange traffic with these guys uh, such that the, the apps and the content companies decide some of them feel like they need to pay or at least have a discussion with the carriers about paying? Um, that's what the net neutrality advocates worry about. And it's, uh, you know, a big part of that sort of traffic interconnection business is very unregulated right now. And you know, I think I think the instinct of, of regulators is not to do anything that they could be accused of quote regulating the internet. So, 
it's a very gray area. As I said, I don't think the carriers are going to do anything to provoke, you know, to, to sort of play into the worst fears or the, or the, you know, some of the things that net neutrality advocates say might happen in an unregulated broadband world. Um, but I do think this is, you know, I think three or four years from now, we will look back on this past two-week period where Chairman Wheeler gave a speech saying, I'm open to carrier experimentation on the net neutrality front uh, as far as two-sided business models go. And then the DC Circuit comes down just days later and says, yeah, that's what the FCC has to do. They, have to, they can't be so strict on broadband regulation when it comes to two-sided markets. I think, I think those two events together will be looked at a few years from now as, as a potential turning point in you know, the evolution of the, the broadband business. Do you see risk to the, um, to, the, to the cable companies themselves from this, so that if, if they start to enter into these kinds of negotiations, it may turn out that they're not the ones with, the market, with, with more power? I mean, that Netflix could turn around and say, you know, we want not, maybe not payment from you, but we want special treatment from you, not, you know, and, and have, the, you know, have the situation be reversed rather than what people yeah, tend to think. Absolutely, great question. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly why, in some ways, while Netflix has to be on guard, that a, 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 a truly deregulated environment could be perhaps to their disadvantage. They've got a tremendous amount of consumer power themselves. You could almost think of this as like, the new retrans, right? It's uh, those, those blackout disputes that we all will probably end up talking about today as well. Um, you know, it's who has more power, the broadcaster or the cable company in any given dispute, and right now it's the broadcaster. Um, but so maybe if we analogize this to what you just said, uh, you know, is Netflix the broadcaster? Do they have enough power to inflict more damage on any broadband provider who might want to try to extract money from Netflix? Netflix can say, you know what, we're going to issue a, a letter to your, you know, an announcement that if uh, if, if to your broadband subscribers that if you insist on trying to extract money from us, we will turn off Netflix to your broadband subs and we'll see who suffers more. Because um, we saw, you know, it's not apples to apples at all, but in the CBS Time Warner Cable big blackout over the summer, Time Warner Cable suffered more subscriber defections than I think most people expected. And I think that was sort of... Um, you know, a bit of a concern for the cable operators who are in future retrans disputes, pick your battles carefully. And it's not clear, but certainly I, I directionally agree with your, your point, Scott, that Netflix may have enough power to protect themselves. They don't need the government, perhaps. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the broadcasters. Uh, where does, um, where does, or even does over the air fit in with this, with Arrow? Um, the case going to the Supreme, the Supreme Court agreeing to hear it, and uh, is it is it a sideshow um, that will just ultimately affect broadcasters and not necessarily consumers? Um, how, how does this? How do you think it fits? I mean, from from the perspective that I cover Aereo from, what institutional investors are mostly concerned about is the prospect of cable companies of, of Aereo being legalized by the Supreme Court and then cable companies adopting Aereo and stop, stopping the payment of retrans fees, which are about $4 billion this year. So it would be a huge, huge shift of, you know, balance of power in the, in the pay TV ecosystem if that were to happen. I think that that will not happen quickly and perhaps not at all, in my view. Um, there's a lot of hurdles that I see for um, between where we are today and a cable company actually adopting Aereo. So first, obviously, the Supreme Court would have to uphold Aereo on all counts. There's multiple arguments broadcasters make against Aereo. So let's say Aereo does win. It's probably a coin flip at this point. You know, predicting court outcomes is pretty hazardous. You know, I do it anyway, but it's, it's you know, even after watching oral arguments, you know, half the time I'm wrong. It's really hard to predict these. Things. So 50% chance Aereo wins the case in June. Um, the battle then shifts to Congress. And the broadcasters will say to Congress, look, clearly the court got it wrong or whatever. You know, Aereo found this interesting gray area that you, you guys in Congress need to correct now, right? Or do you want the broadcast business to disappear? So I think certainly there'll be receptivity in Congress if we get to that point where Congress is going to say, look, you know, what Aereo is doing at some level sort of looks like a cable system and maybe they probably ought to pay. We don't want to kill them, but, you know. So I think, I think broadcasters have a good opportunity in Congress to still ultimately get a bill passed that, um, that protects them in some way from Aereo, even if that doesn't happen. So let's say a Supreme Court, Aereo wins in the Supreme Court, Congress doesn't do anything. Then are we at the point where a cable company could adopt Aereo 
and stop paying retrans fees? And my answer is still, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Put yourself in the shoes of the cable company. I mean, even if area was legal on a standalone basis, according to the Supreme Court, depending on how a cable company integrates Aereo into its system, the, or I'll say this, the more, that, the more that a cable company integrates Aereo into its system, the more that the broadcasters have a new legal argument that even if Aereo is legal on a standalone basis, it's not legal the way cable is doing it. In other words, it's circumventing what Congress intended in the 92 Cable Act regarding the payment of retrans from cable to broadcasters. So you've still got, you may still have some legal risk there with a cable company adopting Aereo and integrating it in certain ways into their network. Um, last point is, well, two more. Th these are all hurdles, by the way. I mean, I'm only on number three. There's like seven in some, a note I wrote for our clients recently, but, um, I and I won't go through all, but, you know, the other one is, um, again, from the cable perspective, if you get to the point, is legal, Congress hasn't acted to stop Aereo, um, I assume broadcasters are just going to keep trying to get something done in Congress, right? It's not like they're going to try for three months and if Congress doesn't fix it in three months, they're going to say, all right, area is legal, right? I mean, they're going to keep coming in Congress. And I, and I wonder whether cable operators would want to really evolve their business model in a way that suddenly area is their new delivery, way of delivering broadcast TV signals, knowing that the broadcasters are still going to keep fighting in Congress and sooner or later may well get a bill passed. Right? In other words, there's constant congressional overhang if you want a cable company and you want to just do Aereo and stop paying retrans. And then the last point is, suppose you get to the point, okay, so cable adopts Aereo, stops paying retrans for six months or a year, you know, really bad scenario for the broadcasters. Um, and, then con and then Congress finally says, you know what, Aereo is going to be like a cable company. They've got to pay retrans. It's no longer... Um, you know, or they, or, they, or they just say Aereo is illegal. Either way, if you're a broadcaster and for the last six months or a year the cable company hasn't been paying you, how quick are you going to be to sell them the legal rights to carry your signal again, right? I mean, I would guess that a broadcaster's first instinct might well be to say, you know, I think it's time for you to go without broadcast signals for a while. So I, you know, and then there's the whole scenario of, you know, broadcast networks becoming cable channels and just completely taking broadcast content away from Aereo, um, which we have a whole additional discussion. It's, sorry, it's a long answer, but I mean, I just see it's not, not a risk at all. It's, it is a, definitely a risk for the broadcasters, but at least from the way that I get questions from our clients about it, I just see a number of hurdles before it could really be impactful to the broadcasters. Howard, how do you view Aereo? Yeah, I, I think Aereo is the is, is sort of the tip of the sword on, on the argument or the, the debate. I don't think it will, um, you know, whether Aereo, and if anybody here has, has, uh, has used Aereo, it's, it's not the most consumer-friendly application. I mean, when you, for, for the mass of people that are used to turning on the television set and watching their favorite channel uh, or watching it on their, uh, on their app, um, it's, it's, n it's not, it, it, it in and of itself uh, doesn't seem to be to be the answer to or the, the solution to or the problem, depending on whose, whose side of it is. Um, but it, but it, it begins to force a whole lot of questions, and I think Paul has, has raised a number of those. The one I would add to the mix is if, that if you get into this situation where Area wins at the court, and I would agree with the with the hazard notion of what you know of trying to predict what will happen. But but if Area wins at the court, um, and I haven't seen as yet the kind of political um, groundswell or uh, that I might have expected that the broadcasters might have on the hill that you know people worried about what is going will happen if Area uh, wins because Area did win you know, in the, in the Second Circuit. Um, but I think that it, it, if Aereo, you know, continues on, on uh, you know, does win at the, at the, the Supreme Court, um, it begins to me to beg the question of what is, the, what is a, a broadcaster and what is the public interest in maintaining the system that we have had for decades, which is company X gets free spectrum, the, the, you know, the benefit of the bargain is supposed to be this adherence to the public interest standard, which uh, if you ask most of the public interest community would think there isn't much left to that. Um, broadcasters um, 
if they're not going to get the benefits of retransmission consent, which was a significant change in their lives beginning in 1992, you begin to really wonder whether the whole notion of, of free over the air broadcasting, and even that word free I'll use with, with air quotes around it, um, that, that whether that continues to be viable in an age when a, a lot of other types of businesses might make better, more efficient use of that spectrum, and if, if, the, if the broadcast networks want to go to cable, so be it. Um, so I'm not predicting any of that either happening in a quick time frame, but I do think it begins to me to, to force you intellectually to look at the broad underpinnings of the whole uh, you know, of the whole regime that we've got for broadcasting. Do you think that even, um, say, absent the various uh, rules uh, with regarding over-the-air broadcasting, must carry and, and, and retrans, um, is there a way to think of, of does over-the-air, free over-the-air broadcasting have any competitive effects on the market? Um, or is it completely, does it completely rely on sort of the existing legal and regulatory structure? Well, look, and I'll go back to the inertia point, okay? Mm -hmm. there, there's still, um, there is a disproportionate attraction to um, adherence to consumption of broadcast television, which if you think about it, you know, there, there's four major broadcast networks. And to me, it's, you know, it's still surprising that they get, you know, the, the big news is cable continues to climb in the ratings and broadcast uh, and broadcast, you know, in all of its various problems. But it's still sort of somewhat shocking that, broad, that four broadcast stations or, or networks get as much of the audience share as they do. And there is still a, and, and I don't know how much, you know, everyone asks the biggest question I, uh, you know, I'll always get, I suspect that Paul gets, so when is that tipping point? And what is the tipping point? And when is it that, you know, that that, that broadcast model doesn't work? But, you know, you still have, um, you know, uh, and, and you know, kind of an overweight of the consumer's time spent on the major broadcast networks today. Uh, advertisers still spend more on broadcast television than a pure look at ratings and, and the distribution of ratings, uh, and especially when then you carry it over to the use of, of uh, the, the amount of time and usage um, that extends to the online world. Broadcast television still gets a disproportionate share of, of that advertising dollar and the, and the consumer's attention, and, and therefore commands a, you know, still a, a, a more important role in the marketplace for people that produce content that still look, if they can, to get it distribute, distributed many times in its initial window on broadcast television. Um, you still have uh, the Carrie Underwood sound of music, which I've written about this, you know, uh, from an aesthetic point of view, I might uh, have uh, some very strong views as to, as to what it lacked, but boy, that was a pretty great business success in a very crowded marketplace of a, of a you know, almost 60-year-old artistic property that drew a tremendous disproportionate part of the audience by being on broadcast television. So um, long and short, it... The, the great challenge and one of those, the, the, the challenge and opportunity for the broadcasters is while they still have that disproportionate uh, and almost illogical um, overweight in the market, how do they use it and how do they take advantage of it um, before they really don't have it anymore? Um, let's, coming back to the policy uh, side again, um, a la carte is always popular, right, um, among, at least among politicians. Uh, and so there's often bills to promote a la carte uh, programming. Um, is that, is there, Paul, do you think there's a risk that, uh, any chance of that actually, of that happening? Uh, or in what's the direction the market is going in, in any way? I think that the things that, that Jeff's paper um, pointed out and uh, some of the things that Howard was saying about the evolution of the video market is really good for cable operators and content companies in the sense of um, signaling to regulators, giving some actual empirical evidence that the market is changing and that yes, pay TV prices rise faster than inflation, they always have, they probably always will, but there are, there are you know, consumers are reacting to that in small but meaningful ways and to the extent that people in Washington, members of Congress like Senator McCain, 
eight months ago or in you know, Representative Eshoo two months ago with her retrans slash unbundling bill that you can make an argument that the, the market is changing, consumers are speaking, and um, this isn't a market that the pay TV market that needs to be regulated for unbundling. It doesn't need to be addressed by the government. Um, so I think everything that, so, you know, some of the evidence that Jeff and others have come up with is sort of, I would think would be helpful to the companies along those lines in, in pushing back on in, uh, efforts in Congress or other places to, to get into the unbundling question or channel, channel unbundling. The other thing is, on unbundling, is we've already seen this movie, right? We, in 2005, 2006, there was a big push at the FCC and in Congress among some folks to uh, move to a more unbundled, you know, set of channel offerings, at least at the wholesale level. Um, Congress took a look at it, the FCC took a look at it, and decided that, um, you know, we love the idea of it. Consumer surveys show that people only want to pay for what they watch, 12 to 15 channels. Um, but the reality is unless Congress is willing and the FCC is willing to regulate per channel prices that are charged by, let's say, Disney to Time Warner Cable at the wholesale level or that Time Warner Cable charges to their retail pay TV, it's not going to work. And, and I think Washington's appetite for um, that kind of heavy regulatory scheme and a workably competitive uh, pay TV market is not high. So. Do you think there's a, what, what so, sorts of legislation do you think might have a chance of, of passing or is it something that just really in reality isn't going to be touched? I think there'll always be bills that get introduced. Maybe you'll have hearings um, on them around unbundling because it is such a, a, you know, an attractive issue from the consumer perspective at the headline level. But um, to me, it would be hard to get a bill through, you know, a, a, any Congress that is com where, where Republicans would have blocking power to argue that a market with, you know, four pay TV providers in, in most areas, at least three and often four, ought to be regulated more heavily. That just strikes me as probably a non-starter. I mean, I think the one, the one area that's worth keeping an eye on is, um, you know, the FCC and the Justice Department, would they ever decide that there is some kind of um, bundling or tying issue that happens when content companies sell their channels to distributors? Um, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal, you guys may remember, about 18 months ago, uh, yeah, 18 months ago, where, where the Journal reported that DOJ was looking at whether, um, you know, there's some sort of collusion going on between distributors and content companies maybe aimed at, um, limiting over-the-top video competition, and, and I think you can, you, can, you can extrapolate a bundling inquiry from that potentially, but um, long answer, the short answer is I'd be, I'd be pretty surprised if Washington moved in that direction. So to, to take it a little bit uh, into left field, um, with the uh, spectrum incentive auctions coming up, um, do you think uh, the FCC would have any incentive to look at regulations that might, uh, uh, I don't know what the right way to put it is, but rate rules that currently help uh, increase the value of broadcasting stations um, to sort of induce them to participate in the, in the auctions? Or would, do you think that's sort of too far afield? Well, it's an easy system? question for me to, it's an easy question for me to answer because the chairman's already spoken on it. Okay. Um, he said, yes, we're gonna consider all of, you know, all of our policies, um, uh, that have any, any rational connection to the spectrum auction in that way because we really want to make sure this auction works and we want to have a coherent um, way of thinking about things like media ownership and um, I don't know what else might come up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he, and he's already signaled in, in, for example, in foreign ownership that uh, if, if foreign entities want to own U.S. broadcast assets that their chances of getting government approval are higher if they're interested, if they, exhibit some, you know, measurable level of commitment to participating in the broadcast auction. So I think definitely the FCC is going to look at other policies that on the surface seem unrelated to the auction through the lens of the auction. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, to back up just, uh, just a bit before we leave the a la carte question, um, Howard, in the, do you, where, do you see, uh, how do you see consumer preferences changing towards, towards this issue? I mean, is it something that um, consumers, uh, you know, truly demonstrate a desire for or 
or, or not? I mean, do they in fact not really, are they not really willing to pay much for it? Well, look, <clears throat> I, th I think you have to look at what consumers say and what consumers do. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, during my time and, and uh, uh, you know, overseeing a bunch of research that we, um, during my years at CNBC and elsewhere of, 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 you know, you'd ask in a survey, and if, if you believed surveys, you'd think that the highest rated programs on television would be CNN, PBS, uh, and, um, you know, the David Susskind show, for those of you who, who go back that far. Um, and you know what, funny enough, uh, those don't really uh, tend to be the most, uh, you know, uh, highly watched programs. Uh, and, you know, the racy, uh, desperate housewives does well in red states, not just in blue states. And so I think that what consume, and almost everybody I know, and I get blamed for it by many friends, you know, outside of the media business, can't you do something about, can't I just get what I want? And, and, and you know, the, the, why do I have to get all these channels when I only watch, you know, uh, uh, I, I only watch, uh, you know, CNN and, and uh, oh, by the way, yes, and the Yankee games. Um, but uh, but the, the, the reality for most consumers is, and, and, and a lot of times I, I, you know, people make the analogy to, isn't it just gonna be like music? And look at what happened with music and you know, everything, pe people could get, could get it on their own and, and that's where it'll go. And I think video's different. And I think that um, you know, the, the value equation, there was always a kind of a problem of, there's one or two hit songs, but you had to buy the album. And, and you didn't, you know, and as soon as you didn't have that, that uh, option, uh, that did become a very, a very viable first a illegal market and then uh, an increasingly uh, successful between individual downloads and the, and the subscription model growing in terms of Spotify and, and you know, Slacker, et cetera. Um, but, but for video, consumers still watch an enormous amount, consume an enormous amount of television of, uh, of, and of the you know linear television programs uh, you know Nielsen uh, about a year ago um, and we'll you know we badmouth Nielsen on the one hand and then we use their data on the other hand so I'll uh, I'll recognize my cognitive dissonance there but but Nielsen reported that the average you know American is still watches roughly 150 hours of television a month. And you know that is, and you know, in every room I'm ever in, you ask people how much television they watch, and they always say about between 15 and 20 minutes, you know, a day. So somewhere in the Midwest, people are watching about 28 hours of television a day to make the numbers work. Okay, but but again, between what people say and what they do, there is an enormous consumption of a lot of television content, and so for a lot of people, um, that paying for the bundle does actually make sense. In, in, even in an economic sense, as much as they complain and don't like it. Now, when is the tipping point? How much it is, is it? Um, I suspect there's never a tipping point and it's just a, a, a bending point. Um, I think that, and I, I, again, I, you know, um, maybe long answer to your question, but I think that the, the piece that I might pull out and say worthy of greatest concern and maybe, maybe ultimately not necessarily legislation, but but inquiry in the public policy community is the role of sports in this, mm -hmm. and that that the the cost of sports is so enormous. And you know, when an ESPN is getting uh, a, a you know five six dollars you know per subscriber per month, there are roughly a hundred million homes that have multi-channel video. Do the math quickly. That's pretty good business. Um, but even ESPN to defend ESPN, ESPN spends a fortune to sports leagues in order to acquire the content to be able to put on ESPN. So their, their enormous, you know, the money that they're taking in, all, you know, goes back to the leagues, uh, goes back to the players, you know, agents, et cetera, and fosters a very expensive ecosystem that the public, through uh, antitrust exemptions, through paying for infrastructure for stadiums, et cetera, you know, help support. And, and maybe there is, you know, the element of that, that which is still not everybody um, watches or, or cares about sports, and whether that becomes something that really pushes a different kind of approach seems to me, you know, possible. Um, I, I have a lot of questions to ask, but we should probably um, 
go to the, to, uh, the audience for questions. But can, can I, can yes, I, I was, oh, uh, please do, because I was yeah. about to ask you something. Yeah, so go no, ahead. no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I just thought I'd jump in on this a la carte issue. I, that's exactly uh, what I was going to ask you. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, so <clears throat> economics research has actually a decent amount to say on this, and, uh, and I think it, it, it blends well with what Paul and Howard were talking about. So there, actually last year a paper came out uh, in the AER that, uh, that was looking at you know, what would be the actual ramifications of you know, imposing unbundling entirely on the cable industry. And, and it's interesting because it's, uh, it, it taps into a lot of what Paul was saying where it, it shows this kind of counter, counter, countervailing forces for the consumer where on the one hand it can be good. So consumers I think in their heads say, I only watch 12 or 15 channels, why am I paying for 100, right? And so on the one hand, what cable companies are able to do is aggregate preferences, which actually allows them to extract more surplus in general by doing that. Um, so if you disaggregate, then the consumer potentially can be better off. But on the flip side, you've got the cost, the change. So you have to think about all the negotiations that would occur between the cable companies and the content providers. And what this paper basically shows is that those costs will go up significantly. And it goes to Paul's point, which is then now what? Do we have to regulate those prices right, to keep things reasonable? Um, and there's not much appetite to be doing that. Um, this is a Greg Crawford? Yeah, paper? Crawford, yeah. you recall your paper. Who had been a chief economist at the FCC. Yeah, right. So it's a uh, it's very interesting paper. And, it, uh, and on a side note, I think what also comes out of that, it's uh, you know, it, it highlights, again, the, the need to try and get more access to some of the data with the industry. So it uses a lot of different data sources, but you know, I, I just jotted down, it, they use the television and cable fact book from Warren Communications, and in the paper they note that four-fifths of the data are missing or not updated. And it's like, wow, you know, this is, we're in big data world and this is what we're dealing with, and, uh, and this is the best we can do. And it, it's an excellent paper, but they're, they're really hamstrung by some real data issues. Um, but something else that I thought worth bringing up, which kind of taps into what Howard was saying, is uh, you know, it's clear that the consumer does think that unbundling somehow is good for them, right? There, there's just tons, and from the surveys, right? So for whatever surveys are worth, this is what we often have to rely on, you know, and myself included, for better or worse. But, uh, but in the sense of what their perspective is, I think the survey is at least conveying information, that the consumer thinks that there's something good for them if, if unbundling occurs, although they, I would argue most of them aren't going to be thinking about the issues that the, the Crawford and Uricoli paper are going to bring up. Um, you know, there's a downside, right? Um, and, but it begs a really interesting question. I've spoken to some people in this room about this, and uh, logistically it's very difficult, but it, it makes for an interesting kind of thought experiment of, you know, are there ways for competitors in this market, cable companies, satellite companies, to at least somewhat unbundle, right, strategically in a sense, you know, to the extent that that's possible. I know there's a lot of most favored nation clauses, all kinds of things going on with all the content providers, but to even provide the perception to the consumer that there's some unbundling occurring, right, and that's somehow good for them, uh, you know, does that go anywhere competitively, right? So getting outside of the policy angle of all this, uh, is there a strategic benefit to, to having some semblance of an unbundle uh, in the products that you offer. Um, logistically, how easy is that to do? It sounds like it's very hard uh, from what I've learned. But, uh, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting question given that um, the consumer seems to think they want it. Uh, it's very difficult to provide and even you know, the potential benefits are unclear. But even if you can give you know, just the slightest inch in that direction, would that at least provide this perception that, hey, you know, I'm catering to what you seem to want. Um, even though you may not realize how much it's really truly benefiting you. So we'll, we'll trick you by pretending to give you what you think you want. Right, right. <laughs> not that I'm advocating that, but, it's, uh, but it, it, it kind of begs that broader question because it's, it is this right. issue where the consumer uh, has a perception, but I think most of them haven't really thought through what all the underlying economic ramifications would be if, if they actually got what they wanted. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's take some questions. Um, okay, let's start here. Wait, wait for the mic. Ashley's coming right behind you. Um, so I was wondering um, what you all thought about the generational effects and what those long-term trends are because I don't know if I can properly consider myself a cord cutter. I grew up with TV, but I've never had any sort of subscription to traditional 
television services. I get all my shows, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and you talk about a la carte channels, I'm thinking a la carte television shows. I have my four shows that I'm watching right now. I know where to get them. The incentives for me are to never at this point get any traditional subscription service because I know exactly where I can get all the individual things that I want, and I know a lot of my friends are trending towards the same idea. I don't know anyone at this point that has any traditional subscription service. Um, we are all relying on these online services. I'm, you know, I wonder what you think the long-term impacts and trends of that will be. Can I? I'll jump. I'll jump in first, just because we have a little bit to say about about that in our paper. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll let these guys talk more about kind of the, the policy side and things. But. Uh, what we found is consistent with what you're saying in the sense of, uh, at least over the short time span that we researched, there seemed to be a divergence in who the cord cutter, what the cord cutter looked like. Um, and so I, I think the question we had in mind was, you know, the early cord cutters you might think are younger people that uh, particularly might benefit from cost savings from this, things like that. Um, and then eventually it starts to diffuse into the mainstream, right, where uh, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s are also doing it, right? Um, at least over the short time span that we observed, that was not the case. The, the, the group that was doing it was becoming younger and more broke, right, that <laughs> wanted to, to get this done. And uh, so, you know, the long-term ramifications of that, at least at the very least, it kind of suggests that that's the more concentrated it becomes in that group, then if you think about the long run, right, then that group becomes the, the other demographic groups over time. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it means in the short run, maybe it's, it's not going to diffuse that fast, but in the long run, that, that group will become the dominant force. And so, you know, is that, is that my prediction? I, I don't want to go that far. We're, we're over a short time span. But we, we thought that was kind of an interesting trend that we saw uh, did, over did that we, time period. Did we used to see um, uh, people, of the, people who are of the age now who don't subscribe to traditional pay TV, did people of that age used to subscribe? You know, I mean, because some things you know, younger people just don't have. Like, you know, when you're in college, you don't own a sofa, and you, you go and buy one later. It doesn't mean that as they went through, sofas disappeared. No, that's um, right. That's a good point. But but if if they if one of the first things they did was go out and buy uh, cable TV, and that's not happening now, that's a different. No, and, and Howard and Paul might be able to speak more directly to that. But just to give my quick answer to that, it's uh, at the very least, uh, over our time span, they were doing so more earlier than they were later. So at the very least, they're they're doing it. They were doing it less. Uh -huh. Uh, more recently, but uh, can I go as far as to say, were they by and large always subscribing to cable or satellite, kind of before 2008 or you know whatever that that cutoff might be? Um, I don't have the data to really truly answer that, but but maybe these guys have more insight on that. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll I'll chime in and, and then and then turn to Paul. I, I guess a couple things occur to me. Number one, uh, there are at least at I'll, I'll be anecdotal about this. I don't have any, you know, uh, Jeff-type research to reference. But, but the um, the number of young people that use their parents' passwords for HBO Go uh, and for Netflix, Netflix, I find particularly interesting and wonder how long, you know, you can do you continue, you know, when you have, you know, you're married with three kids, you still using your parents' <laughs> HBO Go password? The answer is maybe, but I just. Um, you know, so there, there is some element of this is a really great way to get TV because my parents are paying for it. So, so that, you know, biologically we know that can't continue forever. Um, the second I'd say what, what is the, that the, the type of content that I suspect you're watching on, and, and, you know, and people who are cutting the cord or the cord nevers, which is the most frightening thing, of course, for, for people in the, in, in the media business, um, what is it that's being consumed? And I don't think it's overwhelmingly cat videos. It's, it's high quality um, television, television shows and motion pictures that, er, that came through that more traditional ecosystem that were funded by, in part by advertisers initially on broadcast or cable, by a um, by a studio that put that was paid by a premium service such as HBO 
or, or Showtime or Netflix, um, but that paid for the creation of that high quality content. There, uh, there was an assumption of monies that would come later through foreign rights. And of course, what, what does foreign rights mean? It means just that, that uh, consumers in other countries are ultimately footing the bill for those foreign rights. So that, that still is, depends on um, what I said initially, which is a system which we're all still trying to figure out, but which requires funding. And so, yes, for now, there's plenty of great content that you can get cutting the cord, but 10 years from now, people won't keep making the same kinds of shows without somebody paying for it. Whether instead of $9.99 a month, you end up paying $15.99 a month maybe for Netflix because um, there's just not a, you know, now Netflix is spending more on original content and there's less available on broadcast and cable television, but you can get more of it on Netflix. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe there are more Hulu Plus type of services out there, which if you have Hulu Plus, you pay for over the top, but you also suffer through uh, a, a, a pretty heavy load of advertising in order to watch those shows, even on Hulu Plus, not just Hulu. Um, so I think that, that, that how that gets funded is, is a big question going forward. And the last point, I'll go back to the sports point, which is none of what I suspect you, you know, in your queue um, is live sports. And, and how is that, that ecosystem still needs um, between now, you know, maybe we'll get to the point where the Super Bowl is an a la carte event and, you know, people don't care as much about the regular season and just that, that hundred million audience uh, will just fork over the money to pay, it. maybe. But that's still paying and back to the, what the consumer gets in the bargain, is that really such a better deal than paying for all this big bundle? Um, and it may just happen anyway and it doesn't matter, but um, I think that sports is this unique, live sports is this unique thing that still exists outside of that world that you're talking about. Yeah, not really much to add. I mean, great business and sort of consumer behavior points by uh, Jeff and Howard. I mean, the only thing I'd say is a, the, the, um, the rise of Cord Never is sort of plays into that larger point I was making earlier about how, uh, you know, as original programming gets... Um, financed by companies like Netflix, uh, that you know you have data points that include the core nevers that I think if push comes to shove in Congress or at the FCC, that is another helpful, very helpful development that while Wall Street's worried about it, at least in Washington, that's a good card to play for um, the existing pay TV providers. Actually, I'll just add a couple of things also. Um, I mean, I also, we, we, we don't, we, we cut the cord. Um, as well, uh, for a while, it looked like my daughter was going to become a NASCAR fan, and I was I was worried that we were going to have to subscribe again. But um, I was able to nip that, but despite my North Carolina heritage. Um, but uh, also, you know, when you think about uh, uh, Netflix, um, and you say you, you sort of choose by show what you want to watch, uh, Netflix is still a, a, a you know an aggregation of content, um, and you know just like uh, it's just a different kind of bundle. Um, and you know you get these, you see these things online when their their different agreements expire. You know, watch all of X shows by the end of December because they're they're going to go away. Um, and you know maybe it's it's just it's it bundles are one kind of aggregation of content. Netflix is is another. Um, also with live sports, Verizon is going to stream the Super Bowl, right? On mobile devices, is that is that right? And so is Fox. Right. Okay, so that's right. that's a sort of a, yeah. a new, something different in live sports now. Yeah. Um, Anyway, okay, there was another question right there. And Mike is coming. Good morning, I'm Gary Arlen. Thanks for your presentations. Uh, this has a little to do with a la carte, but also some of the things Howard just said about uh, uh, this, uh, this intermediation. Last week, Richard Plepler, the uh, CEO of HBO, pretty much telescoped that HBO Go is going to go direct to viewer at some point, pretty soon probably. I mean, that takes away the MSOs, the intermediaries in this, and does change the business model significantly. They're already doing it overseas, and it actually puts HBO in a much more competitive situation with Netflix. At the same time, Howard, your comment about quality, high-value uh, programming from respected studios, clearly a major player, but Google's big investment, which has been not proven yet, in original short-form content, which is internet video desirable by the kind of audience you represented, suggests a very big landscape change. Uh, collectively, those two issues do suggest some business models are forthcoming. How they're going to play out, I'd like to hear you talk about that, both the a la carte for premium content and 
this new content, which can be sold in very different ways than the linear formats that we, we see so far on all the networks. Uh, well, I guess um, some of the, uh, I'll come back to the point, which is however the content, whatever the content is, and whatever platform it is distributed on, and however and however often it's, it's consumed, you need a business model, which is how, how is, how am I gonna pay for this? What is my ROI going to be when, at, when, as I create the content? So even though it is, and for, so DreamWorks bought um, Awesomeness TV and, and uh, purchased it for, I think, 37 million with a, with a potential uh, to, to go up to 133 million. And, and, and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg has spoken very um, passionately and eloquently about <clears throat> the the um, sort of the, the this new wave of uh, shorter form and different kinds of programming uh, awesomeness TV he, he describes as the the kind of content that um, as you're online you know literally online not not in a digital online but the, the old-fashioned lines that we live in in New York every single day uh, and what do you do with your time and wa watching a five minute show from awesomeness TV is a, is you know a Katzenberg thinks sees is a pretty smart guy, you know, is a real marketplace there. But all of those types of things, and, and, and DreamWorks is a smaller, but yet kind of a relatively traditional um, uh, studio. Um, but it, it still comes back to, so how will that be funded? Because they didn't, you know, DreamWorks didn't spend what will be up to $133 million because they're interested in it, right? They're, so they, they want to return on that. And there's going to be some combination there of, of, of bundling. You know, you've heard to Netflix as a different kind of bundle. So it is, do you become a subscriber to Awesomeness TV? Is, it, is there enough of a, of a market um, in terms of viewership that the pre, a pre-roll will be watched? Will people watch a five-second pre-roll? Will that be, get enough of the advertise, of attention from the eyeballs that the advertiser thinks that's worth it. Those are all things, and people are, I mean, you, we, we all can see sort of really incredibly, even on broadcast television, very short ads that you, you, know, you would never have had years ago. People are experimenting, and, but at the end of the day, um, you've got to come up with a, 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 you know, and I think the most successful people will be um, a, a, a spreading of the, the risks and the rewards of the development of that content. And I think there still is a tremendous desire for, however you define it, good quality content that comes from creative minds and that touches us emotionally and, and, and you know, whether it makes us laugh, cry, et cetera. And, um, and you know, again, my, you know, my uh, teenage daughters um, get a lot of enjoyment watching in a, in a, you know, in a digital nonlinear platform programs that were created for broadcast television in the 1980s. I mean, there's still, you know, there, if, it, if it's cute kids or, or uh, a funny story, um, that still has a value. I'm most amazed, I didn't know there was a network called Awesomeness TV. It sounds like they're trying a little too hard. It, it, it's, it's uh, uh, well, whatever they did, they sold it for uh, millions of dollars, yeah, so, that's right. you know, I, I, I wish I could bars. be as goofy as them on that, so. <laughs> True enough. You know, just, um, Scott, the other thing that is um, interesting about the, the question is it, it makes a point that I think we all kind of are hopefully are aware of, which is because part of what we're talking about on the panel is what is the evolution of the video market and is there, you know, how much risk is there either from Washington or just through the or organic evolution of the business, the pay TV business, to lead to the unbundling or the sort of decline over time of the, of the existing pay TV model. And really, I think what the question shows or underscores, and it's, it's, obvi it's an, an obvious but important point, is that the content companies are going to decide. It's their stuff. If they only want to sell it to the existing pay TV distributors, that's, it'll, be, it'll be hard for, you know, uh, uh, for people to get what they want outside the pay TV ecosystem. But when Netflix makes it available to me just over broadband and I can get HBO plus Netflix plus Hulu or plus Aereo or whatever's out there, it becomes, you know, content has, you know, Time Warner, if you're right, Time Warner is saying we're going to make HBO available online 
Um, that is one, one less tether for me to my pay TV subscription. So really content's going to decide whether and to what extent um, over the top ever becomes you know, a competitor or not even, not even true, a true pay TV substitute, but just enough good stuff outside the ecosystem that um, cable and satellite companies are no longer the only place I can get what I need. And, and I'll just, you know, uh, sort of reiterate the same thing, which is that it, that it is, an, you know, people complain about the bundle, et cetera, and tend to blame the cable company or their MS, you know, the, in, in a lot of cases. And, um, and having been in the cable business for a number of years, uh, um, you know, can relate to the frustration of being blamed for that when it's the content. You know, it's it's a it's a marriage of uh, the content creator, owner, dis uh, provider, and and the distributor. And uh, if the content providers, as the content providers decide that there are better alternative means or supplementary, because they really hope that it's uh, you know in HBO doing this, they're not certainly trying to undermine their cable business. What they're trying to do is they're seeing a trend in cable, wanting to take advantage of a, of a new opportunity, but they owned it. They, they funded it, and they're trying to figure out the ROI and that initial investment in the Sopranos or whatever the, you know, uh, the latest series is. Um, yeah, right there. Uh, wait for that. Oh, sorry, okay, here. And then, okay, there and then there. Hi, uh, Bryce Bashick with Bloomberg BNA. This is a great conversation. Thanks for uh, coming. Um, one piece of legislation I hadn't heard uh, mentioned was Rockefeller's online video bill. Um, wondering uh, what impact do you think that legislation will have, if any, and uh, could elements of that be incorporated into the re reauthorization of Stella? Uh, I'll start on that. Um, yeah, I think the Rockefeller bill, the way it's currently written, will be hard to pass because it takes on all, at least most of the existing segments of the telecom media sector in ways that they would prefer not to be taken on. So it, it's a hard bill to pass the way it's currently written. I think it's still important, though, for a couple of reasons. One is that, yes, pieces of it could potentially be airlifted into a Stella bill or some other bill that's moving. Um, the second thing is that it does, I think, send a signal to the FCC that this is what the chairman of the oversight committee thinks is important in the area of video. And um, so I think that, you know, Chairman Wheeler cares a lot about what Chairman Rockefeller thinks and Chairman Rockefeller laid out his views in the video market pretty extensively in that bill. So things like, for example, um, promoting over-the-top video as a competitor to pay TV service, um, you know, is a signal that I suspect probably was absorbed at the FCC from the Rockefeller bill. So, yeah, long as I, I even though I suspect the bill is currently written, probably doesn't get passed. I think it's important because of who it's coming from and the fact that the FCC cares what Mr. Rockefeller thinks. I'm, what, I'm wondering about your thoughts on uh, the impact of the net neutrality decision on HBO's, you know, more recent indications that they would like to perhaps bypass uh, some of the current distributors to go direct to the consumer. And does that provide um, a leverage opportunity for the distributors um, to exercise their pipes um, and use it to influence the distributors to pay a little, uh, the content providers to provide, to, I'm sorry, to pay closer attention to those decisions. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll say, in terms of that, I don't think that um, even though in, in some sense the, you know, the net neutrality decision might uh, on the surface kind of op open up the gates for more, um, interference or, or discriminatory behavior uh, along the lines that, you know, towards disfavored um, uh, 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 application uh, services. But I think, at least my sense is that the, that the um, I don't follow this as closely as Paul, but the experience that Comcast went through before there were the net, these net neutrality rules um, in the BitTorrent situation and uh, and and just the sort of 
from what I know of the people I know at Comcast, you know, sort of the misery that all of that, um, uh, the response to that took. I, I don't think people are, go, you know, there's going to be a lot of quick movement to try to figure out how to um, undermine or lever, you know, use your pipes to uh, to favor or disfavor particular actors. I think where you, what you'll see coming, and the FCC has more or less said, you know, go to it, folks, is um, by the providers is a, a unit based pricing system and something that begins to, that for someone that for, for users, for the cons whether it's the consumers um, and, and, you know, um, and, and, uh, and whether they create a system, a, a, a system of sharing it with the, with the application providers that, you know, if you're watching, you know, you're binging on the, on five seasons of the, of, a, of an HBO series every single day, you know, for a month and, you know, your bill is going to begin to start reflecting that compared to the person who uses it for email. Um, and, and I think, again, the commission under Chairman Janikowski, before Chairman Wheeler, more or less signaled we're, we're not going to stand in the way of that. And I suppose that could change, but it seems to me that's where I, I would see business decisions getting made. I'd offer just a couple quick thoughts as well. Um, I mean, one is that it's one, if HBO were to go um, online only or given an online only option, uh, it's one more opportunity for the cable and wireline providers, and maybe wireless, but probably wireline, to at least talk to HBO about the possibility of a quality of service arrangement where HBO's bits would be guaranteed some certain level of quality, especially with 4K video coming that takes up more space on the internet. Perhaps there's a world where HBO sees some value in ensuring the quality of their service, especially maybe relative to Netflix. That could be kind of a good dynamic for the ISPs to, to play off of. Um, the second point, though, is, to, you know, there's, there's kind of the flip side of what I alluded to earlier. There's, there's sort of voluntary arrangements um, potentially between somebody like HBO as an online service and an ISP. And then there's, there's scenarios that the net neutrality advocates worry about that, that, that are less voluntary that ISPs might say to HBO, go, blah, you know, you got to pay us or you might not get the quality you want. Um, I think HBO is not at all powerless. And I mean, Time Warner, Time Warner as a content company has a lot of you know, uh, leverage with, with cable companies, right, in, in supplying the programming the cable companies need. And it's not impossible, I think, to imagine Time Warner or any, any big content company, you know, incorporating into their future rounds of carriage deals with, with cable companies language that says, you know, and we don't want any monkey business on the broadband side. So I think they, they are not powerless to protect themselves. Hi, uh, Eric Wolf from PBS. Uh, Howard, see me afterward. We'll update you on the eighth most watched network on television <laughs> okay. right now. Um, I, going to the, to the su subject of digital disruption, Howard, you made reference to the fact that that uh, sort of unbundling as it happened in music isn't likely to play out in video. But but both in the print domain and the, and the music domain, what did happen is that essentially, in, in some form or other, Lots of money that went to the incumbents got sucked out of the system. This, I think the size of the overall ecosystem in each of those uh, worlds has shrunk, and different people are making the money than made it before. So if you apply those rules to video, who's going to lose the money in, in the video world? Is it going to be the, the uh, MVPDs? Is it going to be the content companies? Is it going to be uh, the sports leagues? who no longer can get paid as much money? Who, who's gonna, whose money is going to evaporate in this process? Um, the, I, I think that things get, um, will, will get more uh, dispersed. I think that there will be some, uh, what I would suspect we're going to go into a world of where the, the second, the middle tier, if you are in the middle tier business, you are you're at the greatest risk. I think that 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 the mo that the premium, the 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 highest rated, highest you know quality is is very subjective. But you know the highest consumed content um, will still do quite well. And there is still again, which is which explains some of the how you know why when there's all these choices to still 18 million people watch you know Carrie Underwood on you know on Thursday night at nine o'clock. Um, so I, I think that the, that the that a a the top tier and however that is 
distributed and that will alter, but I think the top tier of programming like the big studio movies, you know, will continue to be made and continue to have support. And I think that it, that, that, that bottom level of the, of the independent, um, what had been, it's no longer so independent, but the awesomeness TVs, the, the, the large, you know, variety of YouTube channels and people producing really inexpensive, um, you know, handheld digital camera kind of content uh, will will flourish and will have with without needing anywhere near as much of an investment. Won't need as much uh, uh, R on the I, you know. Um, uh, but I think that middle is, is will really be stressed. So cable networks that have just done sort of okay over the years and shows that, you know, and, and repeats more and more sort of, you know, repeats of programming and sort of the, I think the, the, those, those networks and people who rely on that part of the ecosystem, I think will have the money uh, sucked out of them and whether there is a collapse in terms of the number of networks uh, or those networks begin to be different types of networks and really actually just start to pick up Maybe they see a business in picking up the content from the bottom and, and providing more of an outlet for it uh, and sort of the, that middle tier no longer gets the investment. It, it's, it's, I, I think the motion picture business suggests maybe the, 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 the kind of way these things might go, but um, predicting business as well as predicting the way courts will come out, you know, uh, gets hazardous, but. Um, right there with the, uh, Take them, take them, Mike, if you could. It's just right behind you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, thanks for, for giving us a lot of good information. Um, I want to turn to two topics that we covered just a little bit, but I um, want to expand on that. And I have a two-part question. One is about uh, over-the-air trends, and the second is about data caps. Uh, given the increase in speeds among ISPs, um, and the uh, increase in content availability, uh, do you see the over the air trend or cord cutting, whatever you want to call it, um, increasing rapidly, uh, that trend rapidly accelerating? So that's the over the air question. And the other is, if that's so, uh, do you see ISPs um, uh, increasing their data caps, especially in wireless? Well, I'll talk Let's about start. data caps. I mean, I'm not the right guy to answer whether the trend on, on cord cutting is likely to pick up or accelerate. But on, on data caps, um, it's obviously, it's an issue that's been out for a while, the idea that maybe um, at some point cable operators will have some market power in the broadband business because the networks are capable of higher total speeds than um, wireline, you know, telcos. Uh, it's been an issue, really, I think, that this administration over the past five years has signaled it's keeping an eye on. It wants to see how the broadband market evolves and whether cable gains true market power in a way that's not good for consumers. And I think the signals are being sent periodically. The White House, I think, sent one about six or eight months ago in a report they did. Um, but in some ways, it's sort of, I mean, a couple thoughts. One is cable companies, I believe, have used usage-based pricing mostly in a defensive way right now to say, you know, if we get people who really are going to watch a ton of video, we're going to, we can sort of, there's a cap or a tier that they're going to have to pay more. But for the most part, it has not been a kind of offensive weapon, you know, used to raise, generate a lot of revenue for their bottom lines. Um, so I, I think where maybe uh, the <coughs> issue of data caps becomes a little bit more real is if you do get a company like Sony or Google or Apple or Verizon or the latest one in the Wall Street Journal this week is Amazon. Everybody's talking to the content companies about becoming a nationwide virtual pay TV company. And at some point, maybe Hollywood will give one of those companies the rights. And at that point, if you do have Sony TV rolled out in six months from now, a true pay TV substitute, you could see the FCC signaling to the broadband providers, especially to the cable companies who you know, have a lot of pay TV market share, you know, we just want to make sure you guys don't price broadband in a way that is that is nakedly anti-competitive relative to um, entry by a new over-the-top provider. So I think right now my my view is the the cable companies have you know a good environment for the usage-based pricing to continue to evolve that. 
but that the environment could change in a more you know, uncertain way if you do get entry by an over-the-top provider like Sony. I guess the, uh, the only uh, point I'd add in, in response to your question in terms of the, the rapidity uh, potentially of, of people switching, and, and Jeff you know, may have more you know, again, research to point to about this, but, but I tend to think of these things as evolutionary and not revolutionary, and that, that the trends are certainly there, um, I, I think sometimes I'm, almost, I'm surprised at, at that it isn't, doesn't go faster, but again, I think there's a lot of inertia uh, and there's a lot of um, comfort level that people have about continuing to have all their channels available to them um, despite all the, all, all the chatter. And so I think that it will happen, it is happening, but I just think in the, that I don't see it as, as um, that, you know, uh, late June, uh, it falls off the cliff. So. Yeah, I, I would just reiterate that point. Um, everything I've seen, we have kind of a unique slice of data where we saw a bit of a, a bump um, that, you know, smelled more revolutionary, but it's, when you look at the broader trend, I, I've not seen anything that, that uh, contradicts what Howard's saying. I, I think it, it's definitely a, a bit more of a creep than, than a run. Um, but but you can kind of see that that there is that trend. It's moving in that direction. Um, up here. Yeah, she's bringing the mic. We can hear you. I, I guess we've, we've been talking about it a bit. I think that the I, I think that for a while to come, we'll see the market evolve around this, and that uh, and as opposed to a an aggressive um, you know um, thrust of legislation or or uh, or regulation coming out of the FCC. I mean, I, you know. Um, uh, I worked in Washington so long ago, you know, Democrats and Republicans actually used to work together on legislation. That hasn't happened in, in quite some time. I don't see that immediately happening and developing a consensus around, around legislating, certainly in this area. Um, but I think that the arrangements that, you know, it works for the, uh, you know, the ISPs to have their subscribers able to use HBO Go and Netflix and Hulu, et cetera. It works for them to be able to have, to, for consumers to have that uh, available to them, to have it work well, to not have buffering going on in the middle of movies, et cetera. So there is a mutuality of interest. Now whether, uh, whether and to what extent those, um, uh, th those application providers have to begin to more directly participate in the whether contractually securing or funding the quality of their service, I think the market was is you know to be determined on that. But that's I think where the experiments around that, uh, which may ultimately lead to you know you have Verizon that that goes and does a joint venture with Redbox, and now Verizon has a very direct stake in the success of its over-the-top business as well as. It, you know, it hasn't abandoned Fios by any means. Uh, it's bundle. It, it's, it's, you know, jointly investing in the future of that. Do, do you all um, think that uh, at some point Netflix, or if it's someone else someday, will become so important to broadband demand that the um, major ISPs will just let them co-locate their content right there with them? Which is order to be the ultimate prioritization? Well, there, there have been skirmishes on this front over the past couple of years. Netflix has said, we want to put our 
you know, our facilities as close to the customer as possible, and you should let us do that, cable companies, because it's in your, your broadband customers will be happier. And with one or two exceptions, most cable companies have said, no, we're going to keep the current arrangements. And um, so maybe there's an opportunity there now under the net, new, you know, the sort of evolving, you know, somewhat more carrier friendly net neutrality environment that we're in today for, um, for Netflix and cable companies to re-engage uh, on that point. Is there, you know, is there a payment mechanism that maybe, cause, because I think Netflix has offered the cable companies is let us put our stuff in your head end and we'll, um, the quality of service will be better, and, that, and cable has said no. But but maybe now with, you know, an environment that's shaping up as more carriers have some flexibility to go out and, you know, do arrangements with content or apps companies on a more, you know, customer specific basis. Maybe that that uh, discussion gets reengaged with. Uh, I mean, the challenge is if you're a cable company, you don't want to, you know, uh, start to look like a situation where. You let one company in to uh, your cable head end, and others say, "Well, I want in too." And you start to get, in. and then, you know, if, if cable company says no, companies three through five can't come in. Um, you know, are you inviting a government response there to say you're favoring these guys, or you know, why are you charging this one that and the other one a higher price? It's, you, you know, at some level, you can see why cable doesn't want to open that door, even if there were, there's some reason to think it would be attractive for their subscribers. I think we, we have time for one more question before we're forcibly ejected, um, if there is one. Okay. Well, good. Then we're right on time. Um, so uh, I, I, I enjoyed the panel a lot. Um, I hope you all did. Uh, so please join me in thanking the, the panelists for their very interesting discussion. <laughs>